We're the worst. <clears throat> oh, oh. God. I'm too old for this. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely thought like maybe you'd crash through the whole green screen to come falling down. Now that would that would be, be a fun intro. A blooper. I think we're a little early on that one. A little bit early. Happy New Year week. Is this our last weekend of 2019? It sure is. Wow. Sunday before New Year. So it's the 29th of December this comes out. New Year's Eve is here. You know what's crazy about 2020? Like this, a this, lot. this new decade coming up. Okay, what? This is the decade where pretty likely we will meet our children. We'll meet our children. Yeah, like we'll have kids and stuff. Oh, 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 I was like, meet them where? Okay, I see. At the hospital, I think. I hope. Anyway. Okay, you don't seem to care as uh, no, much as I, I do. No, you th phrased it so weirdly, like not like we'll have children, but like we will meet them. And it made I mean, me we feel will like also we were going to like time travel into the future. And I was like, my first thought was literally, oh my God, so time travel is going to be real so we can go into the future and meet our children. Not, oh, we're going to have them in the present. That could be how it goes. 2020 is going to be a weird decade. I think my brain just doesn't automatically think like oh my children i don't know listen i'm excited to meet you kids um okay i'm kind of but not really i'm not I'm like more focused i'm not on... racing towards it i'll see you when i see you uh, listen em's in 2019 is already thinking about it so i'm in i'm in i've been thinking about my kids for a long long time i'm thinking about geo most of the time so uh i'm a little distracted from that the roaring 20s are back guys that's what i'm actually that's what i thought you were gonna say because i'm pretty excited about that because the 1920s we're, like, cool and all, but, like, had a lot of fucking shit that, you know, let's ignore that. The 2020s is where it's at now. We mm -hmm. got the new Roaring Twenties, got the new Flappers, and that's us. Oh. I'm a Flapper now. Sure. I guess I'm flapping right next to you. <laughs> We're Since... just flapping along. <laughs> Since we do everything together, I guess I'm forced into this weird story. I guess we're flapping. You just forced me to have children in the 2020s, so you know what? I just have a hunch about it. Okay, well, we have uh, children and we're flapping around. All right. It's going to be a good time for you guys, too. I'm sure of it. I'm sure. For my children that are listening one day in this decade, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they'll be listening in this decade. They'll certainly be listening eventually. But like I want to let four. you know before you showed up, you're probably upsetting me and pissing me off today. You're probably annoying me. Go, Go to, to your, your room. room. <laughs> I'm sure they're listening to this just because they want to hear if I was ever actually cool. No, and they're probably, they're probably ironically listening no, to this exactly to quote me and hate doing. me later. They're listening to it so that they can use it, have find ammo against us so that when we say you can't swear, they say, well, look at this episode. Or if we say, oh, you can't do this. Oh, Christine's drunk. Mom, you're drunk in this episode. Like, I guarantee it. Kids, I don't know you yet, and I may not even be your parent yet, but let's just preemptively ground you right now because I'm sure you've done something this week I don't like. So, yeah, you are in big trouble. So just say sorry. Get me. Actually, if you're listening to me, get me. Go get me a drink. Yeah, I know I've actually um, taught you to make grilled cheese by now, so please bring me one. From Skillshare? Sure. If Skillshare, like, in the future is, like, a holographic thing, you know, They've on, on you your hoverboard, <laughs> can you hoverboard a grilled cheese over to me, please? I would be thrilled. I do a lot for you, kids, so if you could just walk into the room right now and just say thank you, I would appreciate it. Just say I love you. I love you back. And say how beautiful we were if you're watching the YouTube video. Say I looked really cool when I was young, and I still look good. You still look, ex say, you didn't change one bit. Exactly. And then I'll unground you. So yeah, let's make that deal. Show this video to me and I'll agree. I promise. Grilled cheese and a drink and say we're beautiful and then you're good. Yep. And also that goes for all of our listeners. If you could please <laughs> send me a our PO box, our, <laughs> our address for grilled cheese is. That's really the way to my heart. Um, also, I just wanted to say before we get, oh, do you have any other updates? No, I'm, I'm happy to be spending my last week in 2019 with you. Our, you know, Even last though, week before your children arrive. Yeah. <laughs> Our last week, child My due date is actually like New Year's Day, so <laughs> I'm getting ready. Blaze's birthday is the second, so he really was almost a New Year's baby. Aww. I know. He has a, I, no, I say it's every year. And he is 1990, so he was like tw like 48 hours away from being an 80s kid. That's true. You're totally he right. He like just missed the cut. He just missed the cut. He, uh, One yeah. of the first kids of the 90s, some he might was. say. He was. Yeah, he has a hard time because I say this every year, but like uh, with Christmas and then New Year's and then everyone's hung over and then January 2nd, everyone's like, we're done with the partying. Thing. Like, everyone's we like, we have to go back to work. Yeah, now. we go back to work. We need to sleep and go back to work. Um, but uh, he doesn't listen to this. So I have some plans 
If what are your plans? Can in, you tell them if he doesn't listen? I'm gonna throw him. A, it's his thirtieth, by the way, 2020. So I'm tra- planning on throwing him a s- surprise party that I have not been fucking invited I know, to. I haven't done it. I said I'm oh, planning okay. on. Th- <laughs> I'm literally telling you right now, Em. <laughs> I know. I just like to give you a hard time. I'll be there. Okay. Well, I uh, I don't tell anyone, guys. Don't tell him because it will really ruin it. Okay, but also tell him not to listen to this episode just in case. He will. I can absolutely guarantee he will not. Okay, gotcha. Um. Uh oh, I want to say since we have no other updates, um, thank you to everybody. I haven't said this yet. Who was very kind to me about my top ten list <laughs> because I know a lot of people were like, first of all, Anthony is not gay. He's bi. So you know what? You I can was wrong. Back off on that. Okay. You gave me so much shit for that. Apparently, there is an episode where he literally says, "Oh no, I date women." So mm, still got a chance. Uh, <laughs> see, Blaze doesn't listen, and I I take full advantage of it. Uh, <laughs> Secondly, a lot of people were very kind about my my just not understanding that it would be a strange thing to also be attracted to some women. Yeah. I just was like, what a surprise that anyone was surprised, I guess. Sexuality is a spectrum. We're, Thank you. We're definitely going to learn a, a lot more about that in the second where my children are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to think by the time that like 2050 rolls around, like sexuality and, I, and gender aren't even a thing. It's just like. That's what I'm saying. We're all floating around doing our thing. We're actually flapping. We're flapping Since around, we're flappers now. <laughs> doing our totally 100% universal non-binary thing. That's what I'm saying. And so I, I, it just never really, like, they were just automatically on the list. And then when I said it, it was just kind of like, oh, I guess people wouldn't know that about me. So I don't know. It's not, somebody messed me and said, you don't got to label that shit. So I said, I won't do it. That's true. Christine unlabeled. That's 2020. 2020. Coming, 2020. Coming to theaters near you. A whole decade of that. Get ready. Can you wait? I can't. <laughs> Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's talk about you again. Oh, please. We know that I need to be spoken about at least every 30 seconds. Um, I Well, I said this last episode, I feel like we should keep pushing it. But please, if you have not yet, go get our tickets <laughs> every time. for our live show. Um, I have no idea at this point where we are ticket-wise and how many people or how many spots are still open. But presumably there will still be some openings in some spaces and we would love to try to get as many tickets sold as possible and see as many beautiful people as we can uh, yeah you better be beautiful if you're not don't <laughs> buy a ticket just don't even come actually no um but yeah we're super pumped 2020 tour sounds just super cool yeah 2020 we're gonna come at you big and we have a new logo and a tour name and a, a whole shebang we have by this point presumably figured out oh, i just got the, butterflies and one i know vomit. i do too <coughs> I'm retching. Um, we're very excited. We're very nervous. So please buy tickets. We would love to sell out some venues. Um, and we would love to see see you. Yeah. What it I just hit said. me a little bit that I that I have to I be know. on the stage. We need some antacids in here, Ooh. kids. I need an antacid. I know I told you to bring me a grilled cheese, but I'm having some dietary di- dairy issues. That's the truth. That's probably true. I'm still probably going to be wearing this Crohn's is cray T-shirt. I imagine in the 2020s, you and I at some point like live together just we just morph our homes it's together. gotta be i mean we basically do now so like eventually we're just gonna say oh stop with the pretending so to my kids go give Aunt christine a hug and bring her grilled cheese oh if we have children we have to live t- there's no way we're gonna function they're gonna be the weirdest fucking kids like they're just gonna be surrounded yes. in crime and paranormal <laughs> shit there's literally robert the dolls and i'm gonna be like you can't touch that it will haunt you. They're going to be the weirdest kids, especially at a sleepover. Like, I'm not allowed to touch dolls. They're all cursed. Yeah. I actually <laughs> brought my doll with me. It's a little, it has a demon in it, but don't worry. Just don't say, don't say its name three times and we'll be fine. Ugh. Also, I brought a Ouija board, but my mom makes me do a, do a chant beforehand so that nothing bad happens. Kids, if you don't have friends, it's your, it's my fault, not yours. Don't, you, you know what's don't take be, it personal. I fucked up. Yeah. I was bound to fuck you up in some it's way. It's actually, I think your grandma's fault. Go talk to that's Renata. The truth. She did some stuff to me and I did it to you. Call her up. She's, and that's you... the circle of life. Mm-hmm. Just flapping through it. Tell her if she didn't mess me up, I wouldn't have messed you up so bad. That's so. It, It's all grandma's fault. And then bring her a drink because she probably needs one. <laughs> My mom has told me that when I have kids, she wants to be a Nana. So I'm assuming that's what we go with. Kids, tell your Nana that it's all her fault. Yeah, Everything. I'm, I'm assuming we're going with Oma just because, you know, the German tradition. Perfect. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Now, kids, go away. I'm about to tell a scary story. Yeah, this is not for your ears. Uh, as but like, the stove where the grilled cheese is made is. So. And the haunted dolls surrounding the stove. <laughs> but earmuffs. 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 So uh, this is a uh, a story that I covered at a live show that we have not released. This was my story I did in Kansas City. Um, Woo-woo. This is the story of the Sour Castle. Yay. Also, since we're not going to Kansas City in our 2020 tour, um, this is a nice little homage to you because we did have a great time. Not personal, just didn't fit in the schedule. 
Yes. But we do love you. And um, I have a special place in my heart. So we love you, Kansas City. That's true. I think in Kansas City was where you got a one of our fans gifted you a shirt that was signed <gasps> by yes. Fall Out Boy. No, you're totally right. Of course you have a soft spot for Kansas City. It's kids, don't touch that. That is mommy's. <laughs> Even though I've turned it into a pillow and it's got all my <laughs> drool and wine stains on it. Don't touch it. <clears throat> anyway. So this is the Sour Castle. Right. Am I saying it right? I'm sure that's a German word. Yeah. Zawa. Okay. Za- okay. Sour. I'm not going to say it like Just that. Just say sour. Zawa. <laughs> that's how you forget. <laughs> yeah. Did I do it? Yep. Okay. I'm not, Just I'm say gonna sour. How do you say castle in German? Uh, Schloss. Do you say that before or after? Is it like you say? Uh, you say Schloss. Zawa. Schloss Zawa. Like Schloss Neuschwanstein. Neuschwanstein. Oh, exactly like that, right. That's what the Disney castle is based on. Huh. Okay. Doesn't matter. Okay. Fun fact. No, bring it up. Let's hear it. Neuschwanstein, like the big, beautiful. Like Cinderella's castle? Yes. Huh. Or the one in like the, when it says Walt Disney and it has all the things. Oh. That's the Neuschwanstein. How about that? It's a beautiful place. Okay. Anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> so, uh, I was... I think this was the case. At least it sounds like it looks like this was the case based on my notes. But I think Kansas City was actually one of our earliest shows. And the fact that we still use a projector at our shows and right. we still did. And that's why we draw, I think. Yeah, we must have. Right. I don't know if we I don't know. It, uh, we're going to find out in my. Well, I don't see any. And that's why we draw oh, stuff. here. Maybe we were just using the projector. Maybe. I don't but know. That's weird. I don't think we did. So this. my notes, I back when we used a projector to make sure that I would actually click the slides at the right time, I would put this massive highlighted dot in front of a, bu- a bullet note so i knew to press the button back like then. a big red line and it's there which means that i must have used the projector maybe the projector was broken that day or something i don't know it was we were on our way out of using the projector at live shows yeah um but anyway so if we used a projector then you're one of the only people who ever saw us using slides in our shows congratulations Aww. to you okay so sour castle again true to fashion i just picked this story before we started i have not read the notes so we're going to ride this ride together, and it's going to be bumpy. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Take your Dramamine now. Get ready. So we start apparently almost 150 years ago. Cool. Because it literally says almost 150 years ago. So probably we've reached 150 now since it's almost 2020. Oh, you maybe. we did this about a year ago? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this castle is apparently almost 100 years old. Um, it is listed as one of the 10 most endangered buildings in Kansas City. This is where I probably told the audience to go, ooh, ah. Mm. Ooh, ah. I'll thank you, it. thank you. So in 1858, there was an Austrian man named Anton Sauer. Anton Sauer. <laughs> it's <pretty> good. Okay. <laughs> uh, and his wife, Francisca. Oh, that's my sister's name. Is Francisca and Francesca the same thing? Like, because Francesca, the I mean, German it, or it's Austrian. It's like the equivalent. Name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming it's Francisca. But it's, it's Anton and his wife, Francesca. And their five kids immigrated to New York City to be near family. In 1868, Francesca died and Anton was sick with TB, tuberculosis, my favorite, consumption. Consumption. Um, He moved his family to Kansas City so he could be near the fresh air because apparently Kansas City had some of the freshest air in the country. Uh, You still do. And at the time, if you had consumption slash tuberculosis, they thought the best way Mm -hmm. to heal yourself was to be out in the fresh air. So that's why they ended up moving to this area. Got it. He fell in love with his second wife there named Mary, who was a widow with two daughters. Wait, what happened to Francisca? She died. She died, and then he also oh, got FTB. tuberculosis. Sorry. I, I I don't know how she died. It oh. just says in 1868, she died, and then he contracted TB. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So then once he moved to Kansas City, I think she probably died when they were in New York, and then he was by himself and sick. So he, he brought his kids to, to, to uh, Kansas City for his tuberculosis. Got it. TB and Casey. <clears throat> there it is. That's, That's a, probably say. exactly what you said there. <laughs> Honestly, this is probably an exact reenactment that we don't even know we're reenacting. Everyone's like, they're saying the thing. And we're like, are we doing the thing? Yep. Um, yep, we are. So he fell in love with his second wife, Mary, <clears throat> who was a widow with two daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, together, they bought the property for their family of nine. Yikes. That's Woof. a lot of people. Um, which, oh, which actually became a family of 14 because they had five more kids. Oh, wow. Did you like how I learned that with you? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I was like, oh, it gets bigger. Um, so he, they used this property to build their mansion and it was nicer than any mansion nearby. And it had a four story lookout tower. Lord almighty. That sounds way fun. Wow. Four stories. Sounds like a lot of stairs though. (sighs) You know, you know, an elevator was not in that place yet. yet. Um, 
It had a four-story lookout tower, a marble grand parlor fire pa- fireplace, wow. a library, and a music space. That's fun. That's kind of cute. Super cute. The mansion also had a 12-foot ceilings. Love a good 12-foot ceiling. Love that sounds good. not wildly tall. Yeah, I'm like, this kind of... That's probably like a 10-foot 10 10 ceiling. 10-foot, yeah. Um, I guess 12-foot back then was like a well, that's crazy. True. That's true. Um, had a four-story staircase made of walnut and oak. A lot of trees died that day. Beautiful. Um, so that's the real tragedy. Imported chandeliers and furniture came from Italy. Interesting. Fun fact. Uh, it was built by the first trained architect in Kansas City named Asa B.B. Cross. ABC. Aw. <clears throat> and it was known, the building in, the, in, the, in this town was known to be, quote, the finest example of an Italian villa in the entire state of Kansas. Wow. Although there was, like, not much to compare it to, but... Oh, so this is Kansas City, <clears throat> Kansas, not Missouri. Kansas City, Kansas. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, I've covered the wrong half of your city. Or actually, I think it might have. Yeah, in the entire state of Kansas. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, sorry. Well, we love both I of you. Up. Are we surprised? Like, I'm. I wish I could act shocked I just, that I did that. I wish I remembered if people reacted to that because I feel like they would have been like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> they probably did, and then they were like, "This isn't. That's why we drink." I don't know why. And then I'm why surprised. are we? Yeah. Why are we yelling? <clears throat> so, uh, fun fact. A perk of this property is that it was very close to the Santa Fe Trail, which at the time was the main highway in the area. Okay. Okay. Um, In 1878, so 10 years after he got tuberculosis and moved there, their infant daughter, Helen, died, yikes, and was temporarily buried in the family garden. Temporarily. Oh, dear. A year later, Anton died in the master bedroom and was buried at Union Hill Cemetery, which apparently, I remember that getting a lot of applause. I weirdly was just about to say, that sounds familiar. And I was like, why is everyone clapping for a cemetery? Okay. Finally, maybe that one's in Missouri. And they're like, finally, you cross the state. <laughs> they were trying to like help me break even. Um, <clears throat> and so then his daughter was reburied next to him. Okay. Oh, the baby. The baby was Aww. buried next to him. So in 1919, Mary hanged herself in the oh, house. Oh, shit. And one of their daughters named Eve remained in the house after her mother's suicide. And she married uh, William and had one child, Helen. Okay. So now I guess she's running the house with her husband and daughter. Sure. And after they got divorced, Eve married John S. Perkins, who already had... Oh, wait. Hang on a sec. Oh, she got divorced. And then she married a new guy named John, who already had six children of his own. So now he had... Now she had seven kids... In this house with her. They apparently had three more children together. So now it's a family of 12. And then John uh, died by suicide with a handgun at age 73. Um, Eve and their son, John Jr. What? What? Had an infant daughter. What? Her and her son had a daughter? No. You must be reading that right. Wrong. I think I read this wrong. Where? Eve married John Perkins. Uh Uh-huh. John dies. Even John Perkins' son, John Jr., yeah. had an infant Eve, daughter. Even John's son had an oh, infant daughter. Not like thank God. together. <laughs> oh my God. I was like, I'm doing something. No, not no, right. no, no, no. So they're, <clears throat> the two couple, their son had an infant. I see. Right. So John Jr. now has... Okay, so this is like the fifth generation. There's no in incest this in this so far, as far as I can tell. Whew, I was like, I could not... I know I did not read this I'm glad this stage. didn't happen on stage. <laughs> okay. So even John's son, John Jr., had an infant daughter, Cecilia, and Cecilia drowned in the swimming pool. Oh, so there's a, God a lot it. of death in this house. Terrible. And like of generations across. Nevertheless, John Jr. stayed with uh, Eve in the house and his two sisters, Eva... Oh. And Marguerite. Oh, these are beautiful names. Some of my favorite names. Very elegant names. Yeah, Cecilia, Marguerite, Eva. Uh, when you're just being nice to Eva, so she'll edit your parts better. Dude, obvi- edit them better. <laughs> yeah, because that's how this works. Just <laughs> totally write over your voice with better content. <laughs> <laughs> so when Eve passed away in 1955, a man named Paul Barry, he bought the house and lived there until his death in, 18, in 1986. Okay. So he also died there. Jeez. Paul had to regularly, when he was alive, had to regularly shoo people from trying to break in or vandalize the building, which became apparently a daily occurrence. Mm. And in 1987, a year after he died, another couple bought the mansion who wanted to turn it into a bread and, uh, bed and breakfast. <laughs> bread and breakfast. I almost said bread and breakfast. I like bread and breakfast. So. But yeah, it's like additional, like a side to your breakfast I is more it. bread. My grilled cheese, extra bread. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so another couple bought an 87. They wanted to turn into a B&B with colonial characters attached to it. Obsessed. So they wanted to, like, actually dress them up and have them reenacting things that people oh, would do in I different rooms. Oh, I thought you meant colonial character to the house, not, like, no, like literal characters. Like colonial Williamsburg, where you're walking around, yeah, like, I don't, in the I know, 1600s. I no longer love this. I'd rather be left alone. Really? Because I love it so much. I mean, maybe if I'm just watching, but if I have to, like, interact, I just... If I'm at a bed and breakfast, I'm like, I just kind of want to I feel like you would, you would interact with a colonial character the way that all of the women in the office did with Ben franklin oh yeah i'd be like tell me more about do, do you, you wear boxers or pantaloons, pantaloons? he's in oh, his you're knickers pretty saucy <laughs> yikes yeah. that creeps me out to this how i day. imagine you would be at a, at a i think colonial i would actually be breakfast. like oh excuse me oh sorry uh, uh. yeah you'd be avoiding the rooms where they're going to interact with i you. would be very uncomfortable so a year later it was it ended up i guess the bed and breakfast a lot of people felt that same way and it didn't work out well so in 88 it was sold to carl lopp and who was actually a descendant of Anton Sauer. So it went back into the family. Okay. And Carl wanted to restore the building. And apparently, this is a quote from Carl. This house was built by my great-great-grandfather and my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. They all grew up here. Wow. So, of course, you would want to buy that house. Sure, I would, at least. in the family. So that's the history of it. But here are the ghosts. Oh, yeah. it looks like there's a lot to talk about here. Perfect. So... Uh, here are all the ghosts. There's an apparition of a little boy that walks past the windows. That's nice. Super. Um, there are the doors open and close on their own. The windows open and close on their own. There is a shadow figure of a woman hanging in the tower. Okay. Mm-mm. Okay. Mm-mm. And this is all alleged. Let's be clear. Um, well, I think most ghosts are. Yes. I just yeah. before someone who lives there is like, that's not true. It's like, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying this is what the internet has told me. Um, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying the internet says it's true. <laughs> I'm saying there have been rumors, and I'm reporting on the rumors. I'm saying don't sue us, please. We don't. We can't. Please don't sue us. This is a, a fable. Okay. Uh, this there, is a small operation, and we can't afford that many lawyers. We did our best. So there is a shadow figure of a woman walking by and standing in the lookout tower, and sometimes she's crying. I wonder if it's the same. Like, can ghosts have two like two stories versions to them. yeah yeah i wonder like if you like residually yeah maybe it's like i don't know that's a good question like maybe different clips of your life can all show themselves right like there's I wonder if you have the energy to do that or the energy it, of but then also like why would you as a spirit ever want to pick that residual energy right. like i want to pick the one that represents the actual death of me. my suicide so that everyone can watch yeah it's, it seems like you wouldn't do that but maybe you can't pick maybe it's just that had so much energy to it that like that was the thing that maybe remained. like certain times of day maybe like if you could like if there's energy left of you like walking to a garden and smelling the flowers that only happens in the morning right. but at night people can see you like in the lookout tower crying sure um every night crying in the lookout tower that's by me. day smelling flowers by night crying womp womp. um so people have reported uh, hearing a single gunshot oh. which could have been from anton's son our son-in-law who shot himself right um there are floating lights inside and outside of the building lights have also appeared in the lookout tower and people have said that they have heard a baby crying which might be helen which was anton's infant daughter People have uh, come and said that the activity is the most intense in the attic. People have empathetic experiences of feeling emotions that are not theirs mm-hmm. in this house. So they'll just start crying for no reason, get That's angry for no reason. Scary to me. <clears throat> There's also a song that apparently is hummed or sang throughout the house by a distant <gasps> voice. Ooh, spooky. There are strange sounds in the house, mainly the sound of someone walking around upstairs, but nobody's there which okay so footsteps sure um the fireplace uh tools and cover will rattle and shake on their own that would terrify the fireplace yeah no fun fact i when i was a little kid i almost poked my eye out because my mom for the first two years of my life didn't let me have sugar and then on my second birthday i got to have chocolate cake for the first time oh and i lost my goddamn mind and I was sprinting around the house and I fell into the fireplace tools and it, <laughs> and one of them I landed on only an inch away from my eyeball. Uh, so like I had the a, poker? Yeah. Oh. Uh. So I, I had like this massive, for like the first like two or three weeks of my second year, I like had this massive black eye. Oh God. Cause I like really, really fell on it directly with my face. So uh. <laughs> children, I hope you're not listening. Children, this is why I don't give you chocolate cake until your third you birthday. Not till, I thought you were saying until you're 30. I'm like, yes. <laughs> no chocolate until you're 30. Um, or I at least take the fire pokers and put them somewhere else when you're trying cake for the that first time. That might be the better idea. My mom was asking for it. Clearly. Clearly she <laughs> wanted some trouble to happen. 
just shoving like, cake I'm in my bored. mouth. I'm bored. Here's some sugar and some sharp objects. That same birthday was the year where everyone in the 90s was obsessed with Barney. Oh, Me sure, specifically. Yeah. I'll still argue I was the number one Barney I, fan. I will not debate you on that. And uh, that was also the year where all the parents were fed up with Barney in their house. And oh, so God, my on my second birthday, there was a Barney pinata. And my mom said, all of the drunk parents who that were like in their late twenties, early thirties were just beating <laughs> the shit out of Barney. The Barney and all of the two year olds were going, ah, not Barney. <laughs> it's, it's interesting when people buy pinatas of like very lovable characters. And I'm like, yeah. you realize they're about to bash them in. It can't be good for their <laughs> mental health. I would think well, there's a sea of children who are traumatized because of my party. I imagine that it didn't go well. Apparently I ended like up in the hospital, a comedy of errors. Let's put it that way. Let's definitely call it that. A calm. A, no, Com- nope. I tried. The opposite. Didn't work. <clears throat> okay. So fire tools. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's apparently one psychic who says that she felt a doctor who died there and could smell medicine and like the, the smell of a hospital when he was nearby. Ooh, weird. Yeah. You would think. I have distinct smells. Maybe the smell of like fried chicken will follow me. Like or just something really delicious. I hope better than hospital smells. I'm like, there's a lot of things I'd prefer. If you could be haunted by a smell or if you could have a smell associated with you when you haunt people one day, what smell do you want? Probably a food item. Mine's like, fried chicken for yeah, sure. Yeah, fried chicken or like a grilled cheese. I know. I can, I'm just, I'm really what hungry. What is going on today? I'm really hungry for a grilled cheese, guys. We should get some. Let's get a grilled cheese. Dinner is going to be up soon. We should get some grilled cheeses. I know, but yesterday when we ordered food, we just never recorded again. So we should probably finish this. But then we'll get grilled cheese. And then get grilled cheese. Okay. Do you have cheese? I can make. I make a fucking mean grilled cheese. I don't even. And know. not because Skillshare taught me. I ate all me. the bread this morning. <laughs> God damn it, Christine! <laughs> I didn't know we were going to be in this predicament. So when I was uh, in my early twenties, which is not a thing I can say anymore, um, it's terrifying. Uh, oh, I, you'll be fine. <clears throat> I chaperoned my uh, cousin Tanner. Yeah. I chaperoned him for his spring break when he graduated high school, and I was. I, he came back alive, but beyond that, I wasn't a very... I was going to say, you were the chaperone in your early 20s. I this made seems sure like he a had terrible a idea. great fucking time. He had a blast. Oh, I believe it. Uh, because the person in charge was the one causing problems. I was going to say, the one who always encourages everyone else to get wasted is the one who's chaperoning. He definitely listens to the show now, so... I remember there was one day where I think I lost him. I don't really remember. Oh, <laughs> children, you're not allowed to be with, with Funkel M any longer he by had yourself. A good time. There needs to be a chaperone for you and Funkel M at all times. I remember I got him... I think his dad listens to this. And his dad's very uh UJ. I think yeah, UJ. I think Uncle Jeff who calls himself UJ. UJ is my favorite. Um so UJ actually is he really trusted me. I'm about to UJ, you should have known better. I'm about to break that trust. But he was like, You're gonna keep them in line, right? And I was like, Yes, sir. And what did I, you do? I just got them really, really drunk, like super drunk. Um but they had fun. But I made them so many grilled cheeses. That was where that was the week where I learned how to master a grilled cheese. I'm pretty sure I made like 30 in the matter of a weekend. So it seems like I I would like to go on spring break with you where you just get me drunk and feed me grilled cheese. I am a really fun person because like, I mean, to be fair, UJ did like should have trusted me. And now like I'm going to get people fucked up, but I'm going to make sure everyone's safe. And like you just said you lost him. I will not believe this. He story. lost himself. Uh huh. But Like, that's why I was fun at parties, because even though I didn't drink, like, everyone had a blast because I would take care of everyone afterwards. So, Mm. you, I would be fun to take care of you if you were drunk. That's what I just said. You get drunk, and I will make you the best grilled cheese of your life, I promise. Listen, I've gotten drunk so many times, and I've never received a grilled cheese, so I'm I'm kind of disappointed. I never knew until today how much you really wanted them. (laughs) I really want them always. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so, moving on. I'm not going to tell any stories about what happened that spring break, because I think I still want my uncle to love me it's too um, late i think he, he came back it. alive he just graduated from a grade school he's he's doing well in his life so i didn't cause any trouble there no. so oh psychics oh yeah the smell of fried chicken that's how we got where we are okay so neighbors have said that they all have heard laughter shouting and crying from the house um they have also heard yelps and screams as well as mm. knocking sounds coming from all over the building Ugh. There is a regular apparition of a woman who paces the widow's walk up and down. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Um, Many have actually seen another woman's apparition standing in the house staring at you from the top right window. I don't like that one. I don't like when they stare. No, I don't like when they know you. I like when alive people stare. That's correct. Me neither. Although people do say I stare into the camera a lot and they play... uh, (laughs) This, like a blinking, blinking like a staring contest, game? staring contest with me and i'm like i don't even realize i do that i think i'm just mesmerized by the light 
<laughs> that is true. You like guys can't see it, moth. but we <laughs> in the the camera's in the middle of a massive ring light. Right. We can't even it really is, see ourselves. It's just like a big light. Yeah. If we ever look washed out or too dark, we can't tell because this thing's blinding us. It's very blinding. So on Halloween, the spirits of a man and a woman can be seen together in the tower. Weird. Um, there are reports of ghostly moans and people see fire in the tower and flickering lights throughout its rooms. Oh, geez. That's pretty intense. That's like a place you... that didn't seem to burn down. You're right. Huh? I don't feel like fire was ever really. This has to be part of the urban legend part of this, because I don't know of a. It didn't seem like a fire, fire was story. Involved, right. Who knows? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that'd be weird if you like if you died in a very tame way and then now like fire. now all of a sudden there's <laughs> fire everywhere i guess if you're bored you're like i bo- died in a bo- boring way i better if i had that fire. much power as a spirit where i could just conjure fire for no reason absolutely it's a good time um so cindy jones i don't know who that is was in the- <laughs> i don't know oh i think this was like a witness to something i was I, like i hope so <laughs> i was like i don't know who this person is okay so cindy was in the library one day with her father preparing her friend's wedding talking about the spirits around okay. like in this in in the castle her dad was uh, apparently her dad had a story so he jumped in on this and said oh i know about the spirits at that castle apparently at one point her dad was repairing the ceiling there and part of the ceiling got loose and a picture flew out onto the floor oh no um, it was a picture of Anton's granddaughter who not only looked like <gasps> the bride, cause I, I guess they're, oh yeah, it's coming back now. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus. The wedding was happening at this castle. Well, so, yeah, I would imagine. So okay. I gathered, but so the, so the bride that was getting married in that castle that day, a picture flew out Is of the Cindy ceiling. The bride? Cindy's friend. Oh, okay. Um, and so a, a picture of Anton's da- granddaughter Ew. came out of the ceiling that day and looked exactly like the bride. And that was the day of her 20th death anniversary. Yikes. She's like, you better not get married on my death day. Thank you very much. Uh, Cindy has been quoted saying, I've been terrified and most of the time it's during the day. My No, she must work there. I think she does work there. Okay. <laughs> Listen, we're all on this ride. Did I not say it was going to be bumpy? You said she was a friend of the bride and now suddenly she's there every day. She works there and is a friend of the bride. Sure, we'll go with It really that. just said friend's wedding. It says friend's wedding. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, see, I passed me would would fight you on this but i don't know enough anymore i'm not fighting i'm just trying to d- solve the puzzle aren't we all <laughs> so <laughs> cindy We're not doing a great job no, no 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 so cindy has said i've been terrified and most of the time it's during the day my father-in-law laughs at me but he's also had experiences that he can't explain i can't feel it but i wonder if it's just i can feel it but i wonder if it's just in my head hmm. um so apparently most of it is in our head and most of the stories are local lore um, Did you say most of it's in her head? Yep. That's, well, apparently most wow, of it is in her M head. Wow, is ghost shaming. Okay. I think I wrote it in because I knew that when I'm on propranolol, sometimes I forget things that I've prepared. Like, not that I'm like... Only when you're on propranolol, not now or any other time. Specifically when I'm on stage and I'm so nervous to be there, if I have a line I want to say, I'll just write it in to make sure I say it because it's like, I know I'm nervous. Oh, sure, yeah. So it's like, I'm just going to keep it here. So I think... I had written that in, so I would make sure to say, like, well, most of it apparently is in her head, and most of the stories are local lore. Mm -hmm. Um, Historian J.R. Russell is an author who wrote the 1975 article, Old Mansion Filled with Legend, trying to disprove all the stories. Okay. So there have literally been people for decades now trying to prove this. Interesting. Um, or disprove this he says that most of the stories have no actual origin and they are stories told by people in the area and after so long they just kind of stick um most of the stories of weird sounds and items in the house moving on their own are actually the kansas city wind um if the windows are open things just kind of fly across the table and you just (laughs) call it a ghost i'm pretty sure we were like is that true kansas city does that happen (laughs) um and he says that all of the lights that people see are reflections of the windows or off of the windows. Mm. Um, he says that the sounds of the people screaming are from the owner's dog who had a voice box accident and barks weird. Honey, I forgot about this. Can you imagine this. if you're so powerful, though? Your barks, despite your voice box having some issues. Honey. You are still barking loud enough that the entire town believes a legend. That's true. You are literally the <laughs> you, core of this story. You're doing a good job, man. Uh to his credit, though, most of the stories seem to have come from when the Jones family lived there. So, uh, hang on. I lost my spot. Cindy may have been trying to market the castle. Oh, okay. So Cindy not only worked there, but also lived there. 
Yeah, I kind of figured Cindy this out. Cindy is a pivotal since person. you were mad at me for correcting, I just shut up. I wasn't mad. I just am ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> so Cindy lived there, apparently. So uh, Cindy is just this elusive character for all the people who've ever lived there, mm-hmm. I guess. Or ever entered the building. So Cindy uh, may have been trying to market the castle originally when they were trying to sell it um, at the, at, as it was haunted so that people would want to come. Um, but most of her stories seem to happen only to her and only when she's alone, including her saying that she got on a t- <laughs> she got on a tape recorder, apparently saying, ooh, Stop. like ghost sounds. No. And tried Cindy. to and tried to market it as if there were ghosts. Did she actually do that? Including her saying she got on a tape recorder. Oh, she did. So she, she said that she got a, like actually. So she on, admitted it. She said that she got on tape the sound of ghosts, but it's probably her going ooh 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 ooh. Oh, I see. You know, Selena and I used to do that. We used to go ooh ooh ooh, and then we would hide them in closets around the house. And my mom was like, "Please stop wasting all of our batteries." <laughs> you had such a weird, such a weird life. We I love literally it. had no nothing else except we didn't have the internet I yet. Had no guys. other friends. Uh, so. When asked to show it to others, to show this tape where she heard a ghost saying, ooh, when asked to show it to others, she had magically lost this tape recorder. What? So so it might not have even existed at all. Yeah. She just says that she had it. Okay. I imagine. So she didn't even have to record it. I imagine she probably did record it and then realized then after listening it to it, it was like, that's <laughs> too alive. I sound too alive in this. <laughs> True. I so, sound too much like Cindy in this tape. <laughs> It's too Cindy. I need God. to make it more spooky. So beyond the spirits in this house, there are also other legends about the property, which uh, J.R. Russell, the historian, tried to debunk. One is that buried treasures on the property. So people think right. that it is in this area because after Anton died, uh, a fence was being built around the land and a shovel that when they were building the fence around it, a shovel hit a brick and found a brick foundation underneath. Uh, <gasps> With unusual stones at each corner. Get my metal detector. I, I thought it as soon as you went. I'm <gasps> so ready. So apparently there's a brick foundation people didn't know about. And there were some weird stones at every corner. Fantastic. So each corner had arrows. Each corner stone, because they found all the stones, had arrows on them. <gasps> pointing in the same basic direction. And people think those were lines. They converge eventually <gasps> to where the treasure is. Just got chills, goose cam. Another legend is that there is a secret tunnel to the river from the castle, but the um, but the hill the castle sits on is solid rock and no tunnel. I see. So that's um, been like debunked, basically. Right. That one's okay. been. De- Another legend is that a man that once lived on the property murdered his whole family and oh. buried them in the backyard and then died by suicide. So another legend. Interesting legend. But the timelines don't add up for this and no murders on the property have ever been documented. Yeah, that's so a big one. You think that would have a, some... That's a tall story. Tall, tall tale. tale. Um, so another legend is that this land was stolen from the Shawnee tribe. That's probably very mm, believable. Wow, what a legend that is, I'm sure. <laughs> wow, a legend that's also historical fact for most parts <laughs> of the country. Okay, got it. That's a tribe. I probably already told this many times. The Shawnee tribe is the one um, where we live in Cincinnati. Shawnee Run huh. Road. How about that? Mm-hmm. Uh, the So there's records that show that in 1859, there was a native named Tom Big Knife. Also, yeah. Big Knife is a badass last name. I know. They owned the property and continued to live there for several years until the 1860s when Anton bought the land from him. Okay. And the last local legend is that at the end of the Civil War, a woman who lived in this mansion was told her husband was coming back from war and he would be coming back on a particular ferry. But when he didn't show up, she thought he must be dead. So she died by suicide. (gasps) He wasn't dead. He just missed the ferry. I already know. He caught another one and came home to her dead, which, again, I guess is believable. But as someone who has now read as of right now, 152 stories like this. I feel like 85 of them have been a bride waiting for her husband yeah, to come back very, from it's war. It's like a trope. And he then like misses, misses the, the ship. misses the ship and comes back the next day. And like because like it was 24 hours later, she like died by suicide. Unbearable grief. I feel like it, it happens. It's kind a of a, lot. a trope by now. Um. So many inaccuracies here. Uh, one is that in 1859, the land belonged to a native. Uh, na- the land belonged to Native American Tom Big Knife. Um, a married couple did not live there. So when for the oh, the bride to have to debunk this, it's right to debunk this one that the bride was there waiting for her husband. So Tom Big Knife owned this property, not a married couple. The tower was built for the Sowers, and nobody lived there before them. So there's no way that she would have been there to have died by suicide there, because um, the story goes that she died in the tower. And also, there couldn't have been. Uh, 
point. Hang on. I just want to make sure I say it right. Oh, and then some people will say, well, maybe it was a couple or um, uh, like a distant relative that was visiting the Sauer family at the time. And maybe it happened when the Sauer family lived there. But the family didn't own the place yet. They didn't live there. So no, no one related to the Sowers could have died there. So Tom Big Knife had it and then the Sowers and there was no couple in between. Got it. Okay. So um, a local in town named Jason Simmons, he made a Facebook page to raise awareness of the castle to raise funds and restore it, which kind of backfired because although a lot of people garnered interest, it also brought a lot of vandals to the house, Yeah, which means every time that Carl Lopp, the person who the descendant of the Sowers right. who now wants to restore the place. It's like a local was trying to help Carl by saying, like, look at how great this castle is. We should all want to raise funds for it. But now the person who lives there, Carl, he keeps wanting to set up renovations, but they keep getting pushed back because people keep breaking in. Oh, my God. People, stop it. So it still isn't fixed up, or at least at the time that I told the story. Um, in 2015, there's a Facebook message, which is very long, but I read it at the live show, so I'll read it here, too. But it is a Facebook message from Carl Lopp dis discussing these, I guess, these incidents. Ooh, a message to whom? To, I guess, the all those interested in the Kansas city oh, area. Like he posted to the group. He posted to this Facebook page that oh. a local made to help raise awareness of it. And then he jumped on to oh. make a post. So in 2015, Carl Lopp says from the mid fifties on the castle has been the subject of constant trespassing, attempted break-ins, dangerous encounters, and often violence. As a result, from the day I purchased the castle, I have attempted to keep a low pro profile for the castle, believing that the fewer people who knew about the castle, the better. Smart. And then this local was like, let's make a Facebook page. Everybody, look at it. Unfortunately, the Facebook page has brought the castle to the attention of thousands of people, creating tremendous problems for the castle and the restoration efforts. The constant flow of traffic with people trespassing on the property and trying to break in is a sad byproduct of this Facebook page. Really, Aww. like, shading this I, know, I like how local. now you're telling millions of people about it, too. So you're no... Well, that's why I'm putting it here, so nobody go look at this don't castle. Don't do it. Don't do He's it. He's asking for people to stop going. Please, crying. listen to classic Carl. Windows are shot out every month or <gasps> smashed up by those that break in. My caretaker and dogs are harassed nightly and often threatened with physical violence. Who are these people who are like, oh, Facebook group about historical, whatever. Yeah, I'm going to shoot at, the windows in. Who's looking at historical, uh, I guess they're like looking for like places to like. Or maybe they just see it. Be and, hooligans. Yeah, I don't maybe know. it just becomes more well known and people who with bad intentions show up. Eventually word of mouth gets to the wrong people. Yeah, yeah. While this has happened occasionally in the past, the Facebook page has accelerated the level of attention and therefore damage from the people wanting to encounter ghosts. Okay, so it's people who hear it's haunted trying to break in. Shooting the windows. <laughs> okay, very violent people trying to find the ghosts. The police are called on almost nightly, on a, almost on a nightly basis to arrest people who are trespassing on the property. But because of this, I will dispel the myths that most people on this page enjoy fantasizing about. Oh. There are no ghosts and no evil spirits inhabiting the castle or the property. There is no buried treasure, no secret tunnels, no bodies buried there, and nobody hanging in the tower. Sincerely, Carl G. Lopp. So, poor Carl. Even if there is something there, he probably felt obligated to, like, cover it up. So... It doesn't even matter. Like, don't do that. It could be the haunted place in the world. Don't fucking trespass so it, and threaten violence and shoot windows out and harass the dog. So at the end of this i am telling a haunted story that may or may the location may or may not even be haunted according to him it's not although even if it is i'm i would want to not tell that to people if it meant keeping the place safe so yeah and like the people who live there and the dog and the dogs so Yeesh. that is the story of the sour castle yay thank you kansas city okay okay that was fun okay only one more story and then christine's gonna start eating grilled cheese i can't wait <laughs> however you guys are in for a trip because this is probably maybe like the most the story that i've wanted to cover most throughout the entire podcast like what i am okay so wait have you done this before i have at a live show but i've revamped my notes <gasps> i did not revamp my notes as you can tell i did not know who cindy was for <laughs> you at least 50 percent of that story incest and there was not in <laughs> fact you added to the note you you unvamped them i don't know what the opposite of revamp. You i definitely, vamped them. You I definitely vamped them. unvamped them yeah you unvamped them uh, okay well <laughs> blow me away then with your brand new research hopefully now i'm nervous is um, there incest in yours? I'm hoping there's no incest nor uh, Cindy's, but we'll find out together. Fingers no. crossed. Um, so 
this uh, is a story that I covered. Now, speaking of like covering places that we're not going to because we feel bad and we we still oh, it's a ghost. And I'm sorry. And we st- we still love you even though you guys are maybe mad at us. I promise uh, it's not personal. It's not you. We it's didn't us. do it on purpose. But I'm covering a story from Salt Lake. And uh, this is a story that I had wanted to cover for ages. And when we went to Salt Lake, I was like really excited to tell it. And I have since researched a lot more and gotten way more invested and involved in the story. And this is the story of the disappearance of Susan Powell. Okay. I don't remember this. Not at all? Oh, I don't boy. think so. Okay. Let's go. A lot of disappearances on your side of this podcast. Man. <laughs> there so, are. <laughs> eventually, you kind of lose track of them. To be fair, there's a lot of brides waiting on That's uh, fair. husbands in your story. You can probably start just placing bets if the story I'm going to tell is about a bride. That... It's called a drinking game. Every time there's oh, a bride. Yeah, we, that's true. We need a new updated drinking game. Yeah. The old ones, I feel like. Send in your new rules. because We would love some new rules. That's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh... I just want to clarify that since I did these notes in Salt Lake City, I have listened to the Cold podcast, and it's probably, I would say it's probably one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. Um, I mm. binged it pretty quickly, but uh, it's like one of the most informative, well-researched, and well-done podcast I've ever listened to, and it is wow. about this case. Um, it's about this case only. Only. Yep. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's very in depth and very long. So I, I also want to preface. I know a lot of people have suggested I listen to it, and I couldn't tell you, but I was or I had. Um, but I also want to say, like, for those who love that show and have listened, like, this is not going to be nearly as much detail, just because obviously that ep- that podcast had like, I don't know, eighteen episodes, eighteen mm. hour long episodes. I can't fit that all. But gotcha. if you want more, that's where to go. It's so good. So uh, I also apparently back before uh, I'd watched a documentary called Susan Powell and ID Murder Mystery. I love ID. I know. Good stuff. huh? Love ID. Three podcasts, Morbid Generation Y. uh, Oh, and Cold Podcast. And uh, I got information from Heavy.com, the Seattle Times and the Salt Lake Tribune. So let's jump in. Got it. Susan Cox was born in 1981 and grew up in Puyallup, Washington Mm. in the LDS Church. Uh, she was well liked in our community. She was very bright, fun, outgoing, had a lot of friends. Um, and this is just like a fun fact about her. And I remember my notes were very long and this show went way late and our manager came to the show and was like falling asleep in the audience. So <laughs> I'm sorry if you were there and we're like, it is, this is a long ass show. Oh yeah. That's I was, like, again, rushing through that's it. another reason why we're, we're not going to do double shows at, at these cities. Yeah. We did two in one night. And every time we did one that was we didn't do many but every time we did a live show that and then we did another live show the second show went so late that like not that nobody was laughing because it wasn't funny or entertaining but people were literally falling asleep because <laughs> it's just so late it, it happened to work out that every time we had a, a second show it was at like it started at like 11 o'clock at night <laughs> people... which meant it ended at like one in the morning it was <laughs> and then ridiculous we had meet and, greets and people were like i just want to go to bed oh we had one show in nashville that started at uh, like eleven thirty or that something. That one was really wild. That one was tough because it and it was pouring rain, and we were just sitting there in this room. Like it was pouring, pouring rain, and the the roof echoed. So as we were talking, there was just like and we kept making awkward jokes. Like, yep, there's the alien again, and we were like, this is so terrible. So, but also like people were just falling. Over as- we were falling asleep. Over it was it. by the time pe- the people from that show got to have their meet and greet and walk away. It was like two in the morning. Yeah, that was rough. It was tough on all of us so anyway that's why we are not doing second the shows double again. shows in one night yeah that's because no, nobody's much. having fun even if you're trying your hardest to have especially fun especially our manager who was like i didn't know what i signed up for and we were like <laughs> oops but so i the my point is that my notes were really long and i had to cut them back a lot at the time so now i'm trying to expand them back to what they were before gotcha. um, and one of the fun facts that i loved is that growing up she really loved animals and she and her sister created the bird club when they were little precious it just was so sweet and she loved birds and she always grew up with like parakeets and things um so just tells you a little bit about her uh susan's family cared deeply about being a part of the lds church and uh they were really strong about their religious beliefs by the time Susan was 19, she was hoping to get married. She was ready to start a family within the church. Uh, really important to her to stay uh, in the Mormon church. In 2000, uh, 19-year-old Susan attended a church gathering for singles. And that's where she met 24-year-old Josh Powell. They bonded over a similar interest, which is that Josh had a parrot. Oh, so <laughs> tweet, tweet. Look, look I'm interested. <laughs> tweet, tweet. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> Let's fall in love. You all right? Did you get your D-peppy? I had to get my D-peppy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sick. Gotta uh, get my D-pep. <laughs> tweet, tweet. Um, 
<laughs> okay, where are we? Right, he had a parrot. Okay. Uh, so they bonded. She really liked him. Um, and unfortunately, while uh, Susan's upbringing was pretty sheltered and idyllic and happy, uh, Josh's was pretty much exactly the opposite. So a little bit about his family. He was one of four kids. And his family, while initially being part of the LDS church, uh, later on, the parents started having some pretty serious problems and they kind of stepped out of the church. Uh, after his parents got divorced, the his mother and father would often kidnap the children from each other. Like, it was just a very contentious divorce and mm. custody situation. Josh's dad, Stephen, was very abusive toward the children. He mostly took it out on Josh. When the kids were, like, there were some examples, uh, one of them being when the kids wet the bed, he would force them to take an ice bath to, like... <sighs> I do remember this. That was shock. terrible. Yeah, it's really, really, really s- s- fucked up. He would force them into an ice bath to try and, quote-unquote, shock the behavior out. Um, wow. Super great. Uh, he also had an addiction to porn, and he would force his children to watch from a very young age. Mm. Wow. His daughter actually said, this I learned in the cold podcast, his daughter said one time um, they had gone on a trip together, just her and her father, and in the hotel room he made her watch porn and explain how it made her feel. Yeah, that's that's the situation wow. we're in. Is this the one where you fucking sing to me? Damn it, Christine! <laughs> It's like, when will they figure it out? <laughs> when will they figure it are out? Are we going to hold hands again? We are, That's aren't we? up to you. Do I consent to the hand holding? <laughs> well, I suppose. No, absolutely not. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so excited. Okay, great. Uh, anyway. I told you... you it was coming. I warned you. Anyway, anyway, keep going. So Josh, anyway, was grew up in this household. Obviously, it was tumultuous. It was toxic. It was abusive. And this manifested in his behavior being extremely loud. He was obnoxious. He bragged about himself. He was constantly talking about himself. Like, he never... Like, in a situation, people were always very put off by him because he would just turn everything to him and be, like, a very much a know-it-all. Like, he would mm. know better than everyone else. And just that kind of guy where you're like, ugh, not him again. Um, let's just say Susan's friends and family were not thrilled when she said that they were getting married. They were like, mm, I don't know <laughs> Please about don't. this guy. Not this guy. I know he has a parrot, but <laughs> it's like, stop. there's, he, uh, he does not have more redeeming qualities That's than it. that. That's it. <laughs> so you get that. We could take you to a pet store and like, you get your own, <laughs> get parrot. Your own parrot. Oh my God. <clears throat> um, they were still really young. Obviously she was 19. He was 24. Um, in order to save money, they lived with Josh's dad, Steve for a while. And two years later, they moved to a Salt Lake City suburb called West Valley City, and they bought a cute little house. And when Susan got pregnant with her first son, Charlie, um, Josh, she was very excited, and Josh just kind of began to change. He became more aggressive, controlling, uh, one might say abusive. Mm. Uh, She was like, okay, maybe this is temporary. Maybe he's just in a bad place, and like we'll work it out. Uh, Spoiler alert, that's not the case. So one example of this is when Susan went into labor, her dad Chuck had come in to like be with her and he and Susan, she's like, I'm in, I'm, I'm in labor. And, uh, he's, he and Susan say, Josh, we got to go to the hospital. The baby's coming and he's on his laptop and he's like, or his computer. And he's like, uh, I'm actually really busy right now. <laughs> okay. There's literally a tweet going around right now. Like I'm like, I'm like a screenshot of a meme or something <laughs> where some, where the wife says, I my water just broke and the husband says I just made this plate of nachos. I saw Karen. you. I saw you share that, <laughs> Karen. I just made. Okay, but anyway, I just made this grilled cheese. Um, come like, on. honestly, can you just hold it in for like ten more minutes? Like, how long is this really going to take? Right. We we both know you've got a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've watched the videos. Uh, yeah. So it's basically like that. Uh, Got it. But instead of nachos, he was on his computer. He was like obsessed with gadgets and technology and like hoarded them all for himself and would like, he was just always on a computer. Um, and they could not convince him to come. He just wouldn't get off the computer. Mm. So Susan and her dad went alone to the hospital. Eventually, Josh showed up an hour and a half later. He sat next to the window about 20 feet away from the bed, just sat there on his laptop until Chuck was like, you motherfucker get over here your wife and my daughter are having a baby and it is your baby right and she's terrified and you need she's to about there. to go through the most like realistically statistically the most pain of her life and she, alone like don't make yeah, her do she's it about for to the first squeeze time squeeze a human out of her for the first time and like you're just sitting there on your computer you don't give a shit mm, unless you're finding a gadget that, re- that alleviates yeah. labor pain unless you're ordering more painkillers on the internet then <laughs> unless you're stop it. finding a machine that just takes the baby out without yeah. pain zap get out of here unfortunately after the baby was born and then their second brayden two years later uh things just got worse so josh became outright abusive 
no hiding it anymore. He would give Susan $10 a week to buy groceries, mm. along with a list of the only things she was allowed to purchase. Uh, he had trouble holding down a job, so Susan was responsible for making ends meet, and her paycheck was the only steady paycheck coming in, but then he controlled all the money, so she wasn't allowed to use it. Uh, he controlled the kids' food. He would only let them eat one time a day. Uh, the kids actually, one of the sons was actually diagnosed as malnourished because Josh wow. refused to let them eat. And they were little. They were like two and four. Whew. And um, he would refuse to feed them because he would say, you're just going to poop it out. Oh. And it's like, what are you going to do? But the whole, yeah. Not so he gets, out? he gets to eat the whole time. Right. Oh, yeah. He had his, he actually had his own pantry that were f- locked off just for him, his own food. Wow. But his own two-year-old wasn't allowed to eat food. So Susan actually was known to call her friends and ask them to sneak hot dogs over, like raw hot dogs, just so the kids could eat something it's really really bad um so yeah he had his own pantry full of snacks uh he refused to buy christmas presents for the kids um and anytime susan tried to use the atm card he would change the pin number so no what she would do is every uh time she got her paycheck she would just squirrel away a little money so that she could at the end of the year buy christmas gifts for the kids um and uh he meanwhile he was spending thousands of dollars on his computer equipment and other odds and ends like tools he loved like power tools and things and he would just Mm. collect these like really high-end items and just have them in the house um for example one day he bought three thousand pounds of wheat for Mm. no apparent reason and there's a video of susan kind of walking around and like filming everything she's like i don't know josh bought all this wheat like what are we gonna do with all this wheat like beyond eat it because we're not allowed to. yeah we can't and like it's just buckets of wheat like what are you gonna do it's just so strange and like he would do that and then meanwhile be like but you can't have a piece of bread it's it, just really controlling and terrible and also wheat like it's like not even a gadget it's like not even like, right like what are you it's like he's only buying it to prove that he can and right she can't and like where do you even buy that where do you buy <laughs> wheat like a farmer I mean, I do you, go, you to just a farm? go to a farm and buy it i guess listen so. we live in la we don't know these things um so anyway fast forward to monday morning december 7th of 2009 charlie and Braden are four years old and two years old respectively the owner of their daycare uh, grows concerned when she realizes the boys haven't shown up for daycare. And this is really odd because Susan was very punctual and she always went to work and on time. And so she would always bring them in. And if, if they weren't coming in, if they were sick or something was going on, um, she would always call and make sure. So this has never happened before. The daycare owner just has this bad feeling. She called Susan's work. No answer. She called Josh's job um, and they tell her he hadn't come into work that day. And so she starts to get nervous. She's like, neither of them have gone to work. None of them are answering their phones. The kids aren't here. And then she remembers that, um, where am I? I don't know. Oh, sorry. I got overwhelmed with my own story. Uh, so it happens. (laughs) So she stops by their house first and she's like, there's no answer at the door, no footprints in the snow. And then she gets nervous because it doesn't look like anyone has come in or out. So she thinks, oh my God, I remember like we had just they had just been talking about installing a new gas heater. Mm. So she's like, maybe it's carbon monoxide. So she gets really nervous that like, maybe it was installed wrong and they, maybe they were inside and maybe the, you know, gas had been left on. Got it. So she calls the police and they break a window to get in. They find no one in the house. Nothing is disturbed or out of place, except that the family car wasn't in the garage, which is strange because there were no tracks in the mm. snow. So they realize Susan's purse is still in the house with her wallet and her keys. And her friends and family were like, she would never have just left without those things. Right. It's just not normal. They also find a mysterious key hidden in her purse. Uh, Police notice that the couch had recently been washed uh, to a point where two large box fans are blowing onto the couch and the carpet. Oh, so like to dry them. (sighs) Sorry. Like really washed, like freshly washed, like we're still still wet. wet. Yeah. Ugh exactly so there were these giant box fans like drying attempting to dry the couch and the carpet with the only other odd thing going on um so police issue a bolo for the powell's minivan and uh they spend all day looking for them finally around 7 p.m josh just fucking pulls up to the house and everyone's like thank god like they're here Mm. except josh and boys are in the car but susan is nowhere to be found police are like where the hell have you been and he says, oh, around midnight last night, I decided to take the boys camping. I just woke them up and was like, we're going camping. I don't believe you. <laughs> you don't? I'm going to I'm gonna just jump in now with my opinion. On December 7th uh, in Salt Lake, you're not going camping in, at midnight on a Sunday? That's I, strange. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my chips on that one, yeah. All right. If you're in, you're in. I'm in my... I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. No backsies. <laughs> no no taking <laughs> no backsies, guys. No backsies. 
Uh, there was a snowstorm coming in, so police were like, why would you leave knowing there's a snowstorm in the middle of the night to go camping when you have work and school the next day? And Josh said, oh, we do this all the time. And by the way, the boys really like s'mores. Okay. P.S. Here's more validation for my story. P.S. They like s'mores. Not that they're allowed to eat them, I guess, ever. Yeah, P.S. They've literally never had sugar because they don't even have food. I feed them wheat sometimes. They love watching me eat s'mores. So sad. Uh, So then they're like, well, where's Susan? And he's like, oh, she's at work. And they're like, she's not at work, bud. Uh, He's like, hmm, I think she's at work. They're like, she's not at work. Uh, We're here for a reason because we cannot find her. Yeah, that's the point. So where is she? You don't seem concerned. So they take him to the station to interview him. They ask, why on earth would he take two kids out in sub-freezing temperatures on a Sunday night? He says, oh, I forgot it was Sunday. I thought it was Saturday. And throughout all this, he's, like, super nonchalant. He's like, can I go home now? Uh, He doesn't seem to care that his wife is just missing, didn't show up for work. So they bring him in the next day without the kids for a formal interview, and he's just as nonchalant. He either stares blankly or he robotically repeats the same lines over and over. You can watch this video footage online. Um, he's just like a never ending talker and a know it all. So the fact that he's just silent is very odd. Like his friends mm. were like, no, he just fucking never stops talking. He blabs constantly. He knows everything. And in this case, he's just silent. And so they're like, something is going on here. Like if this, this is shady as hell. Then all of a sudden he gets really upset, really upset, like just worked up. And it's not because his wife is missing. It's because police had broken a window to get into his house. Mm. And he's like, why would they break my window? And they're like, we were looking for your missing wife. And he's like, but you didn't have to break my window. Like, he's just like very upset about this broken window. And they're like, that's the most emotion you've shown all day is that we broke a window at your house. Yeah. (sighs) Okay. So police are like, listen, that shouldn't be the concern uh, (laughs) at all, (laughs) at all, even a little bit. Um, And little does Josh know at this point that another detective is simultaneously interviewing his children separately. Mm, I see. When the detective asks four-year-old Charlie, this is chilling also, you watch it on video footage, uh, who are you camping with? He says, my dad and my brother and my mom. When she asks, okay, Charlie, when you came home from camping, who came home with you? He says, my dad. And Charlie says, and she says, what what about your mom? And Charlie says, my mom stayed where the crystals are. Good night. He said, because it's so pretty where the crystals grow. Good night. Goose cam. Of course, when Josh hears this, he's like, they're kids. They don't know what they're ho- what the hell they're talking about. They're lying. He literally called them liars, actually. Uh, but detectives are now like, oh, fuck. We're on high alert. Um, they obviously at this point have nothing to hold Josh. So they have to let him go. They canvas the whole area where he had supposedly gone camping. But there had been no f- or there had been fresh snowfalls. So there were no footprints. They really couldn't find much. They did find like a I think he was like a sheep herder who said, he had seen a literal shepherd yes which actually is what my last name means well actually it's more like what schaefer means my name means slate but i just go with shepherd it's more interesting um that's fine (laughs) do whatever you want in the grand scheme of things call yourself whatever the fuck you want um but uh yeah so he said like oh i saw a sheep herder and uh the sheep they found the guy and the sheep herder was like yeah i did see them in their minivan so they think like this is just a weird way of him like covering his tracks like he really was out there because this guy was like no i saw their minivan mm. um so da 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 no tracks couldn't figure anything out josh is at this point named a person of interest and he moves out in the middle of the night to washington okay he's just like goodbye and they're <laughs> like that's not good bad 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 call there bad, bad sign call. bad sign Meanwhile, Susan's family is trying to spread the word any way they can, which is just pissing Josh off. He finally speaks out, but what he says is shocking. He says, Susan was extremely emotionally abused as a child. He insults her parents. He makes Susan sound promiscuous, rebellious, problematic. He basically says he wants to take her off the pedestal everyone thinks she's on. Wow. But also, didn't she have a great upbringing and he had the bad upbringing? Yes. Okay. But like, also, it's like your wife is... This is not the way a normal person reacts. This is not how we describe our wife when uh, she's missing. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Even if you really believe that, like, it just still doesn't make sense. Like, to this isn't the time for it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Then this fucking shithead dad, Steve, gets involved. Josh's dad. The two of them make a website about Susan's disappearance. Oh, by the way, Josh loved to make websites. Well, that sounds right with yeah. all of this gadget talk. Exactly. And they were like really crappy. Like they weren't like well done, but he called himself like a webmaster. You know, those oh people my who God. do shit like that. And he had one at one point. I remember it's called like, it was called like for the kids with two Z's and he like made it. I'm always crazy. I- <laughs> four, four, four. Shut up. Hey, I was like 11. <laughs> this guy is too old for this crap. 
So they make up this website. And uh, this is the theory that they post on this website. They say, so this guy, Stephen Kosher, had also disappeared from Salt Lake City around the same time. So they invented this theory that she was having an affair with this guy, Stephen Kosher, and they ran away together. But everyone's like, they have never met. There is no connection between them. There's no evidence of it? Not even a little bit. Like, what does this guy have to do with this guy, with her? But so that was the theory they had kind of just concocted is that she, they ran away to Mexico and were having an affair. Um, because they both disappeared around the same time. It wasn't true. Spoiler alert. Got it. So Susan's family and friends are just fucking pissed at this point. They're like, we're trying to find her. And you're on the internet posting like fake stories about how she's having an affair. And we're just trying to find her alive, hopefully. Um, so in February 2010, the Cox family, which is Susan's family, uh, holds a press conference. They break the news that at this point they're like, we have to say something. They break the news that Susan had been a victim of abuse at the hands of Josh. They divulge all the information I mentioned earlier about, like, controlling the money and not letting the kids eat. And they also revealed that the abuse had gotten physical a few times and that she was scared of him. Mm. Obviously, Josh is not thrilled about this uh, mm -hmm. new update. Tips at this point start rolling in, though. One man calls police and says that at a Christmas party in 2008, Josh had told him that he had figured out the best way to hide a dead body. So... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it does sound like one of our conversations. Right. But also, like, when you're in the middle of an investigation where yes. your wife is missing, that's probably, again, not the time to talk about yeah. that. He's really bad at reading rooms, it Well, seems. no, this was before, like, a year before. Oh, oh, oh. The guy just says, oh, I remember one time at a Christmas party. Just, like, what a convenient thing to remember. And also, what a convenient thing. It suggests premeditation. Yeah, it's just, like, not a good look. Most I time, would have, at the very least, deleted that... I like, tried to hide my tracks of any early on thoughts of this to yeah, he cover wasn't, suspicion. He wasn't mostly like the most subtle guy in the world. Doesn't sound like Put it. Put it that way. But uh, he and uh, Susan actually loved like true crime shows. Like They loved Investigation Discovery. They loved all those shows. But so what Josh would do all the time is say, ugh, killers are such idiots. They always mess up. Like, I know how I know how to do it. Like, he would always say, I know better. I know better. And like, I'm sure, which I'm sure, I'm sure is which every oh. killer has said. Honestly, I think a lot of people think that way. They're like, oh, what an idiot. I mean, he, he left the he, fingerprints at the crime. He literally thought he was smarter than all of them. And you're reporting about him right now. Yeah. So clearly you're not smarter than them. Well, we'll see. Oh, God. OK. Uh, so I don't want him to be right in any way. So, w well, we'll see. So in 2008, this he had been blabbing on about how he knew exactly how to hide a dead body. And it was to throw it down a vertical mine shaft. He said no one would ever find it. There's so many mine shafts out in the utah landscape like no one will find it police take this tip very seriously because he was camping out right in, right, right right yeah so they are like we're gonna start searching but this mining country there are tens of thousands of mines out in the desert like some of them thousands of feet deep and also they're very dangerous like the ones that are closed off are closed off for a reason like you're not supposed to go in there they're extremely dangerous so it's very hard to um to search there was one mine, though, called the Ironsides Mine that police were not able to search because someone had poured gasoline down there. And the fumes were so strong that uh, searchers couldn't enter. So that was kind of an odd, an odd update. Uh, mm. One reason they took the lead so seriously is that the mines in the area tended to grow crystals. <gasps> oh, mm. I see. After logging... <coughs> Sorry. Uh, no, you're fine. After logging more than 6,000 man hours, police finally stopped their search. Person hours man hours uh hours just hours they're labor hours labor hours uh police have to stop their search empty-handed they're like there's only so much we can do Six thousand hours of searching mines you know it's where are you gonna go from there so two years later they still have nothing on josh they're frustrated so they turn to the only other person who's kind of involved and who th they think might have some information and that's josh's dad steve they're like he might be our way in since josh just will not give up anything so the Powells and Coxes at this point are on like full out war with each other. Josh had filed a restraining order against Susan's dad, Chuck. And the cops are like, we have this idea. Chuck, says Susan's dad, why don't you organize a public event in an attempt to spread awareness about Susan? The event would take place. <laughs> so police like kind of follow Josh, figured out what grocery store he frequented, then had Chuck set up the, the like march or like the, it was like a honkin' wave where like, they're like, help find Susan. And people like honk and just to draw awareness. Um, so they had him organize this in front of the grocery store where Josh went to. Oh, my gosh. And Chuck was like, I didn't even know that's what they were doing. I thought they were just telling me to hold this 
God. In honor of Susan. And he's like, then later I was like, oh, uh, they did it on purpose. Okay. So uh, they wanted Josh to show up on camera because there were news crews and to get so upset that he said something incriminating. Kind of smart. Yeah. They're like trapping him into this like situation. Emotional yeah. experience. Yeah. Knowing where he would get, knowing he would get pissed. So of course Steve does show up. Uh, news cameras are rolling and Steve starts screaming that Chuck is violating a restraining order. He brought a copy of it with him also. Okay. Um, <laughs> because they're at a shopping center that Josh visits. So this is like a rally to raise a, a rally to raise awareness about Susan and Josh is showing up like you can't do this this is a restraining order violation he's like I'm just talking about my daughter this is not about you this is not right. about like okay. anything you did and Josh is like fuck you you can't do this in my air in my neighborhood um you need to shut this down and then Steve goes Steve the dad goes oh do you to Chuck Susan's father who's missing his daughter he goes do you really think this is gonna do anything and Chuck, and meanwhile, you watch this. Chuck is wearing a shirt with his daughter's face on it that says, like, help find Susan. And this guy's Aww. just screaming at him, like, do you really think this is going to do anything? That's so terrible. It's terrible. So then Steve does a really dumb thing, just like they had hoped. So this is uh, Susan's father-in-law, Josh's dad. This idiot says, well, we have Susan's journal, and they confirm everything about how terrible of a father you were. So police are like, oh, you have her journals. Interesting. Like putty in my hands. Correct. <laughs> Fucking idiot. He's such an idiot. <clears throat> so they were like, well, interesting. Maybe we should know about this. Uh, so they have their way in. They literally, like, the cold podcast plays all the inter like the interviews. And they're so, the police are so good at being like, oh, bud, like, tell us more about mm. how so much Susan meant to you. You know, like, just really playing him. And he's so, he just falls for it. He just wants to talk about her. He wants to talk wow. about her. He just falls for it every time. So finally, they're like, I mean, we can look around, right? Like, we can check out your house, like, just to make sure. I mean, we know you have nothing to do with it. Like, we can check it out. And Love he's it. like, oh, of course. Yeah, totally. So they come <laughs> over and they're like, we're going to find these journals. So they have their way in. They obtain a search warrant. Um, and here we go. This gets a little wild. Not only do they find Susan's journals, which he clearly has, like, he and Josh have stolen and have kept at, at Steve's house. Steve, uh, they also find Steve's journals. And in these journals, it's tens of thousands of pages that he's written. He writes everything down, like, obsessively. Wow. And they find quite some disturbing information. Okay. He reveals that he is madly in love, desperately sexually in love with his daughter-in-law, Susan. He wrote about wanting to share her with Josh, and that was his right to do so. His right. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was his right. Goodbye. The next day, he wrote about sniffing hair uh, <gasps> from her hairbrush that Absolutely he not. collected. Uh, quote, what I've written, this is from his journal. What I've written about Susan represents the first time I've mentioned fetishes and what might be considered sociopathic. I mean, who looks under the bathroom door with a mirror? I tend to think a lot of guys do. So just gives you a little glimpse into what the fuck this guy was doing this whole time. Got it. He said, and remember, they lived with with his dad when they were having money troubles when they first got married. They lived with, and Susan's friends later said that's why they moved. Like, that's why they left, because she couldn't be around her father-in-law anymore. He was so creepy. I was going to say, did she like him back? But no. Okay. No. Hell no. Uh, well, he thought she did. He kept writing, like, Got she's it. resisting. The, the LDS church has brainwashed her. She's resisting her sexual lust for me. And it's like, okay. she's 19. Like, you are a fucking Disgusting. creep. And, like, he has photos from the wedding where he's, like, zoomed in and, like, watching her and writing. Like, she just wants me. She doesn't want Josh. It's beyond. Um, he actually, there's actually a recording in the cold podcast that I didn't know about where he admits, he's like, I'm in love with you. And they're driving. She's driving. And he's recording this and he has a camera. They filmed everything. It was really weird. So he goes, I'm in love with you. And she's like 21. He's 54. And she's just like, I, she's like, Steve, I can't do this. Like, I don't know what you're trying to do. Wow. But like, I can't do this. And he's like, well, I just thought you've been giving me so many signs. And she's Goodbye. like, Goodbye. She's like, I don't know what you think you felt. But like, I didn't, I wasn't trying to give you any, I'm sorry if I misled you. And he's like, you gave me so many signs. And the sign when police were like, oh, well, like, did she ever do anything like to give you the idea she was interested? And he said, yeah, so she had got wax. She was learning to like wax her own light, like wa do waxing, I guess. Um, and she also cut hair and stuff like that. So she had, was uh, practicing her waxing, and she had done it on her own legs. And she's like, "Oh my god, feel like there's like no hair." That and so was he's the like, sign. She wanted me to touch her legs all over, and it was like, "Fuck off!" And then oh, there's one point where he literally says, "They're like," he said, "No," she said, she didn't say no. She said, 
I'm not interested, but that's not, that doesn't, that's not no. And it's like, what the F? This guy is so perverted. If it's not a yes, it's a no. Exactly. If it's not a chant If it's not a resounding If you don't know that and that is not information you're privy to, chant it until you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Not yes equals no. So essentially, exactly. So um, anyway, that's just some, a little tangent, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So da da da. Her uh, her hairbrush. He's like, I smell her hair. I mean, it's just so many things I can't even remember at this point. Uh, along with the journals in his closet, investigators find a collection of Susan's panties that he would steal. Also, uh, you know, in in the LDS Church, they wear these undergarments that are like considered sacred, and it's part of like okay what you wear. Um, and he stole those out of her laundry, and it's like those. And are, if it's sacred, and they're in your community, sacred. yeah, they're like religiously sacred. And he, he would steal them out of her um, laundry, yeah, which is beyond. He took uh, tampons, used cotton balls, y- used tampons, yes, goodbye. Nail clippings. Then he would put them in Ziploc bags with uh, the date. <gasps> yeah. Oh my god! Can you imagine opening that closet? Oh my god! What did he think was going to happen? When they came out, he's like, yeah, you can come check out my house. I wish I could just go from, like, cop to cop to cop and be like, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen? I like, can't even imagine. Not the, like, the most, like, you know, tragic or horrific thing. But, like, sure. what's just the weirdest thing you've seen? Toenail clippings with dates is pretty fucking weird, yeah. Yeah, use tampons with dates on it. Yikes. And that's, that is dark. That's really dark. Really Oof. fucked up. Um, they also discovered that Steve fancied himself a songwriter. <laughs> wait wait for it i know you i know you want me to do it now but put your put down your hand and let me lead up to it stop touching me okay okay <laughs> hands off hands off not your, your, your arm lingered not a yes means a no okay <laughs> sorry shouldn't linger uh he wrote some love songs about susan um the documentary actually played a recording of steve singing the songs uh the documentary i watched but also the uh, the podcast um it's so fucking sinister this like this music one of the songs is called susan with the sunlight hair and actually it used to be called i forget her name like pam or peggy or something with the sunlight hair he wrote it about a different woman who was also married and not interested in him and then he changed the words to susan later on so like he just reused the song from a previous rejected love affair i see correct and um here are the lyrics no no we gotta enter we gotta lace the fingers yeah oh that's not how we hold hands is it that's better wait how do we how would we hold hands that's better that okay i hate it (laughs) i hate it just sing fast (laughs) just sing fast make some room for me (laughs) within you i don't know the tune either yes you do i don't i know you do i know the i know the chorus okay just do it for the moment i begin to smell the perfume in your hair and caress you everywhere. I'm missing you. <laughs> then it goes, I can love you in a secret way. I can love you each and every day. There's nothing I can't see. There's nothing you can't be. It's not perfect, but I'm missing you. Was that good? I would like the next three <laughs> therapy sessions paid for. <laughs> oh, you can expense it. Um, I don't actually know. I literally, I know I can love you in a secret way. I don't know what the fuck the other tunes are. So I just... I want Chris, I want everyone to know that if you were not at the live show, I was not prepared. I didn't know. <laughs> I Chris... wasn't either. I wasn't going to do it, but it was the second show after another show. A lot of show. wine. Yeah, I don't... Christine of held wine. my hand. And also you looked me in the eyes the whole time and you said it a lot slower, only... especially the part about somehow us being in each other. It was very, gr- what's that? <laughs> what's that sentence? Cause I hate it. <laughs> No, oh, we're holding Make hands some good. room for me within you. There it is. I hate that. That was the that was your leading line too. I was Vomitous. like, it's only going to get worse. Vomitous. It's terrible. So thank you. I think. They Am find I supposed all to thank this... you? <laughs> you can do whatever your heart feels, which is probably throw up and run away. <laughs> I, I, okay. <laughs> I really hate that I did this now in audio because I did it live and I was like, well, no one will ever have to hear it again. Now I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> Also, I had like With the video most too. tone deaf person in the on the planet. No, so. you for singing a really horrific song. You sang it well. I wish I knew the. I only heard the chorus, man. I think that's enough. I think it's enough. I don't think. I think we're okay. I think saying "aw shucks" before that is not needed. Uh, <laughs> too bad. Uh, okay, let's move on. Please. And then I write. It doesn't stop there. Oh. <laughs> 
Super. Never mind. <laughs> so they're like, he is deeply sexually obsessed with his daughter-in-law. Uh, they find thousands of images and videos of Susan. He followed her all over town while she ran errands. And in his journals, he would like write accompanying every day that he did this, he would write and he would say, she knew I was watching and she liked it. Like she did it by the way. Like he would literally I stalk hate her. That. And I hate that. So delusional that he would think he would write like, Oh, she loves, she knows I'm like following her. I saw the way she like twisted her skirt or like flipped her hair. I, like she knows I'm watching it. I mean, it is so beyond like upsetting. Like it's <sighs> deeply, darkly upsetting. Um, so he, right, so he filmed her while she ran errands. He would take videos of her across the room when she didn't know he was filming. Um, and so this is obviously quickly why she was like, we need to move out of here. Um, he even had pictures of her face that he would superimpose on bodies of other women, like, you know, collage-like. Um, and he was also physical with her. So when she was in the kitchen, he would often come up and put his hands up her skirt or try to brush up against her. Uh, she imagine had, having to live with that i know i, I just I can't. can't because especially if it's so dark and sinister that you're like you can't escape it at any point and there's no i wonder how i mean i know she clearly knew that he was interested in her but i wonder if she knew about like the the stuff in the I closet i don't think it was that bad i don't think she knew that imagine if you just rolled into like you were like dropping off like laundry or like a book or something and put it in his room and fucking found you all found that. like your own tampons yeah oh my god i know i don't think she knew it was to that extent she just was like listen he said like he's clearly to cross too many lines and um i think he had enough sense to like journal about it rather than like say hey i have your toenail clippings <laughs> like i think he kept that to himself at least he knew some things are best kept alone until like, the on police your own. show up and then oh, he's yikes. like here you go right yeah, so uh, she had revealed to her friends uh, that that was the reason that they had left Washington and moved to Utah. But bro Josh, like, at first he was kind of upset when he found out, but then he, like, brushed it off and was like, it's my dad. It's not a big deal. Um, and it gets worse. So I'm sorry. Let's not gloss over that. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. so he's saying, oh, it's okay that my dad's touching on you. Yeah. Like, it's not it's not as bad as it could be if yep. it were a stranger touching up on you it's someone that's not oh, your husband yep, yep touching up on you yep and also like well, it's, it's, it's that you more said worrying no. it's that it's someone that you, you know said, it's somebody that you said no i don't want this touching you whether it's your relative or a stranger. yeah regardless of your relationship it's someone exactly. who first of all you're married to so you think it, you'd it, care a little bit yeah some someone that you're married to who's saying they are not interested they're not also, comfortable if this is like a like a more traditional style of marriage, like you're you're probably monogamous, like you probably wouldn't want your wife to be with them. Yeah, I I just think if your wife or like for so many reasons you shouldn't. It doesn't. Yeah, right. Like it's obvious, but like if your partner says I'm uncomfortable with this man touching me, by the way, it's your dad. You'd think you'd be like, there, I Wait, would imagine there's the only additional layers of disgust here. But that obviously like just goes to show how fucked up their whole relationship was. Like Josh yeah. was raised by this guy. And so, you know, I mean, he's I mean, been... and he was already, to be fair, he was already abusing her. So he probably exactly. thought this was just one more thing to the docket. Of, and he did get really upset. She said, like, he was furious. And they oh, moved. Okay. He didn't talk to him for months. And then um, eventually he was like, you know what? Like, we just got to move on. Because, like, he just couldn't live without his dad. I think he just created his own excuses in his head. Like, got it. Oh, he's done with it now. Don't worry. Like, it won't come It's in the past or something. Yeah. Like, we just have to move on. And she was like, no. Mm. so it gets worse i know it can't seem like it does but it gets so much worse um steve had also been taking photos and videos of two little girls who lived next door fuck yeah through the windows of them it's spreading when they were on the toilet or taking baths um Ooh. they were very much underage um i think they were t one was 12 one was younger um this is obviously a felony so on september 22nd police arrested steve for child pornography and voyeurism He's sentenced to 30 months in jail. Oh, I also want to add another thing I learned um, from the other sh podcast uh, is that, like, he had videos of himself masturbating to video secret videos he had taken of Susan. So, like, okay. it just, he would literally film himself. He, like, got off to himself getting off on this. Correct. Yes. That's it's just a lot of layers of problems. Meta in the worst way. Um, so, finally, the, so he has this child pornography charge he goes to jail finally the cox family has ammunition to be like we want our grandkids back i mean think about this also there's two little children here the whole time like in the middle of right. this nightmare without their mom so uh the the cox family's finally like we want our grandkids we want uh custody um so they did get a temporary custody order uh to have them live with 
them instead of Steve and Josh. But Josh fucking hated this. Like he was, he just hated that the Cox family was like taking the kids, taking control. It wasn't even about the kids. It was just like that they kind of won over him and like that it was a control thing, I think. Um, but it tries, they might, even though, uh, Steve was in in jail now, they could not get him to admit anything about knowing where Susan was. So eventually they were like, I, we honestly, he believed she was still alive and that she was going to come back and they would get married like he in his journals. So like he was very delusional. And I think finally they realized like he legitimately doesn't know what happened. Like he really, truly wants her to come back and marry him. And he's that delusional. He really believes. Wow. So the grandpa, the dad is just, they're like. He's not going to help us very much. Right. Um, back in Utah, Susan's employer tells police, hey, just so you know, Susan had a safe deposit box here that no one else knew about. Mm. Then they're like, how do we get in? Oh, yeah. Remember that tiny little key we found in her purse that nobody oh, knew right, right, what right. it goes to? Uh, so that key went to the safety deposit box. When they opened it, they discovered video footage. It was like a VHS tape. It was video footage. I don't know if it's VHS tape. It may have been digital at this point. Hmm. Doesn't matter. Uh, video footage Susan had taken on July 29th, 2008. She had talked to a divorce attorney who told her to take video of all the assets in the house so oh, that Josh couldn't like, hide them or anything. In the video, she says, I'm covering all my bases. You can watch this video too. She's kind of like selfieing the camcorder. Got it. She says, I'm covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us, that our assets are documented. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. And then the video ends. It's just very eerie. Because, like, she knew something was up. She, uh, presumably. Yeah. Or she just was like, oh, hoping for the best. And it's like, mm. <laughs> Okay. Unfortunately. Susan's attorney then instructed her to hide the tape somewhere. Uh, somewhere n- nobody would ever have access to it, especially Josh. Uh, but she did end up confronting Josh and saying, listen, if here's a, um, uh, God, I just lost my words. Like a condition, like if you don't shape up by our anniversary. Oh, and a, c- uh, yeah. oh. I know, I lost Ultimatum. Uh, yeah, an ultimatum. Thank you. Um, she gave him an ultimatum. She says, if our marriage isn't working by April, I'm out of here. Um, and so at this point, detectives are like kind of building a case against Josh. They're like, okay, it seems like he's involved. Especially after they found a letter in the safety deposit box was folded up and stapled shut. And on top of it, it was written on top of it was written Susan's last will and testament. And then on the other side of the stapled letter, it says, do not show this to Josh or give this to Josh. I do not trust him. The will and testament said, if anything happens to me, it may or may not. I'm sorry. If anything happens to me, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. Oh, shit. Yes. So she, like you said, knew something was up. Around this time, a guy at a salvage yard in Colorado gets a call from a man who he gets this call. And this man's like, I need a satellite image of the salvage yard where uh, and they're like, why? And he's like, well, I had my car towed there a long time ago. I just want to make sure the car has been destroyed. Can Hmm. you send me a satellite image of the uh, of the salvage yard? Interesting. And they're like, what's your name? And he's like, Michael Powell. And that is Josh's brother. So this guy is watching the news and he's like, weird, that's the same name as like the guy who called and was super sketchy about getting an image of the salvage yard. So the guy calls police. He's like, hey, I recognize this name from your case. Um, It turns out right when Susan disappeared, Michael, uh, Josh's brother, had sold a car for scrap. But the car was like in great condition, like pretty new. He sold it for 200 bucks and paid to have it destroyed. Uh, This didn't make any sense unless there was some involvement, they thought. Um, Cadaver dogs were sent to look at the car, and they immediately alerted to the trunk, indicating that there was decomp in the trunk. Mm. But uh, they didn't find anything. However, I will note that later on when uh, Braden was in kindergarten, I think he was in kindergarten, uh, he drew during craft time, he drew a picture of all of them uh, on a road trip, and then there was a person in the trunk, and they said, who's that? And he said, mommy. Good night. Yep. Nope. Uh, he also told his daycare instructor, <clears throat> or his teacher, I'm not sure which, mommy's missing, but we're not allowed to talk about that or camping. I have a lot of secrets. Okay. This kid is... I bet you do. These poor children, I mean, so disturbed at this point. Like, can wow. you imagine? I mean, especially if your parents... Especially are- also if you're young enough and it's dark enough, like, you'll just repress it totally and eventually you're not going to be able to remember those secrets like i hope he told someone 
before he forgot. Yeah, so unfortunately, so they tested the car. They couldn't find Susan's DNA. Just was like another really frustrating false lead. Meanwhile, considering uh, Josh's control issues, he is losing his mind that he doesn't have the kids. Like he's well, yeah. losing his mind that the Coxes have the kids. Uh, the grandparents are trying everything in their power to give the kids a normal life to uh, prevent Josh from getting the kids back. The kids were like really disturbed at this point. Uh, Chuck says that they every time they went to bed, they insisted on going to bed in the same bed naked. And he's like, why? And he's like, well, daddy doesn't let us wear clothes. Oh, to no. Bed or, and like uh, they said, oh, well, where does he sleep? And he's like, he sleeps in between us in bed with no clothes. Like the whole thing was just like, oh, no. Chuck was like, we were trying to give them some normalcy because they were not normal. Like they were not being raised in a normal household. Right. Um, so at this point, J- uh, Chuck is like, we cannot let them go back to Josh. So he's like, we're going to go through Josh's parents' divorce paperwork and find anything we can to, like, build a case that we want custody of the kids. Because, like, even though Josh is, like, cuckoo, it's really hard to get custody from, like, an actual parent, you sure. know? Um, so, on t- so they go through the divorce paperwork, and what they find is shocking. So on top of all the abusive situations I described earlier about Josh's childhood, like the ice baths, the pornography, they discover that Stephen also encouraged the boys to kick and beat their mother. Okay. Once she had asked Josh to show her more respect and he had responded by saying you have to earn respect mom what have you done to earn my respect (gasps) oh my goodness and this was like all documented in um the divorce paperwork because she's like my children are abusing me my husband's abusing me like it's just wow started from a young age uh josh also killed his sister's gerbil um at one point he attempted to take his own life by hanging um just very troubled childhood susan's friends remembered susan telling them Sorry, Susan's friends remembered Susan telling them that once Josh had threatened that if she <laughs> ever left him, she, that he would do to her what his dad did to his mom, as in, like, beat her up. Destroy her, basically. Uh, More than beat her up. Got you it. know, I mean, get the kids, get, like, just destroy her. <coughs> Got it. Um, beat her, too, I'm sure. And so this is obviously more motive. So the custody hearing um, took place, and Josh argues his side, but then the state prevents an argument, uh, sorry, presents an argument challenging Josh's fitness as a parent. This is what it is. It is incestuous child pornography, but animated uh, on his hard drive. So they had gone and encrypted or decrypted his hard drives and they found animated porn that was incestuous. And this was enough to bring up as a red flag to be like, no, he can't go home with them, with him. They mm. can't go home with him. And I will say, like, it's much more con- complicated than that. And, like, the legal system was all involved in the layers of getting that to court so it's a lot more than that but essentially that's what ended up happening is they found this you know pornography and they were like he's not fit as a parent if he's have has this incestuous pornography got it so uh he was allowed however supervised visitation rights with the kids um and actually he was told he had to take a psychosexual evaluation like he was uh, huh. and this really fucked him up because he's like i'm i don't need to be evaluated i'm fine like giving my kids and they're like not only do you not get your kids now we have to psychosexually evaluate you because like right you're that fucked up and so he is obviously pissed but he does get supervised visitation rights for the meantime only with a social worker present he's humiliated he's pissed off but he takes advantage of the supervised visits um and on february 5th 2012 charlie and Braden's grandparents have no choice but to let them go see their dad um so the social worker takes the kids to josh's house He's waiting outside, and the kids run up to, the, to see him, um, the social worker following behind. And when the boys get inside, Josh takes one look at the social worker, smiles at her, and then shuts the door and locks <gasps> it. Oh, shit. The social worker panics. She hears through the door, Charlie, I have a surprise for you. Oh, and no. then she begins to hear Brayden crying. Uh, and as the door shuts, she also gets a whiff of gasoline. Fuck. So she immediately calls 911, but the dispatcher does not seem to be very concerned. Um, she tells the dispatcher she smells gasoline. Uh, she tells him he's she's moving her car out of the driveway because she's like, there's gasoline. I don't know what's going on. And he keeps being like, sorry, so like, is this your kid? And she's like, no, I'm the social worker. I'm here to be to so supervise. So like the dispatcher's like first day? He just was very much like nonchalant, like, okay. He later like said too chill, <laughs> they, way too chill. He later said he thought like it was the mother and it was like, but she kept saying, I'm the social worker. He's not supposed to have the kids. And she's like, his name's Josh Powell. And I guess the dispatcher didn't recognize the name. And it, it just was like very bad. Like he, he just didn't dispatch police. At one point the call dropped and then she called again Ugh. and he kept saying, well, what's the address? She's like, 
I don't know. I think it's this. And he's like, well, is it or is it not? And oh my gosh. Just like really frustrating to listen to. So eventually, and she's like so patient on the phone. I would be losing my goddamn mind. And he, I know. He literally says, um, Okay, I'll just I'll just tell the story from what I wrote uh, so I don't mess it up. So she says, I'm moving my car out of the driveway. Finally, after several minutes, um, I think it was like eight minutes later, the dispatcher agrees to send police. She asks how long it'll be, and he says, I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency life-threatening situations first. And she yells, this is life-threatening. Or she says, this may be life-threatening. I'm afraid for their lives. And then the call just ends. And moments later, the house explodes. Okay. Um, finally, it takes a long time. It, I think 22 minutes after the call, uh, first responders arrive at the scene. Oh my God. But the fire at this point is too strong. It takes several hours until they can get into the house. Um, the house was fully turned to ash, like completely annihilated. Chuck rushes over the grandpa and tells one of the firefighters, I'm the grandfather. And the man says, hold on a minute and goes to talk to someone. He returns moments later and says, they're gone. So Charlie and Braden had both, um, died of smoke inhalation but they had hatchet marks on their skulls so what had happened is josh had knocked both boys unconscious with an axe to the back of their heads then spread gasoline all through the house and over them and then he sat on a five gallon can of gasoline and lit the gas and the house exploded and the boys were found holding hands god um 20 minutes before setting the fire josh left a voicemail for his family for one of his sisters the voicemail said hey this is josh and i'm calling to say goodbye i am not able to live without my sons and i'm not able to go on anymore i'm sorry to everyone i've heard goodbye so please turn to the only one they can think of who's left is josh's brother michael the one who had dropped the car off at the salvage yard right um but before they can interview him on february 11th 2013 michael powell jumped off a seven-story parking garage to his death Wow. So within a year of finish- finishing his prison sentence, Steve Powell died of a heart attack. So all three of them took any answers they had to their graves. Wow. When police examined Steve's journals after his death, they discovered an entry dated one day after Susan's disappearance that read, I feel like Josh did a truly stupid thing and probably disposed of her body in a truly grotesque way. I think he probably went to some former industrial land just west of West City Valley, no, sorry, West Valley City and cremated her. Josh's life with Susan was utterly miserable. Evidently, this tragedy is my answer for why Josh hung on. He wanted to do it his way and avoid a messy, costly divorce. <laughs> okay, his way is better, I'm sure. Right. <clears throat> Susan Powell, at this point, uh, is still missing, but is presumed dead by the West Valley City Police. Her cause of death is obviously unknown, but many theorize Josh killed her and had been planning to for a while. I think we can all understand why people presume that. Uh, police consider the case open, and they continue to follow any promising leads. In 2010, Susan's family and friends created the Susan Cox Powell Foundation. Who's mi- I'm, I'm amazed they kept the Powell in there. I would have been like, no, right. fuck that. Uh, the Susan Cox Powell Foundation, whose mission is to assist families of missing persons and to support domestic violence prevention efforts with a special emphasis on recognizing the early signs of abuse. Because mm. there were so many times where it seemed like little things, but it, it ended up in the big picture yep. being much more than it seemed. Uh, the actually interesting thing I learned from that cold podcast too, since I've done this, uh, the first time is that the 911 dispatcher, David Lovrak, he was like reprimanded obviously for the way he handled the call. Right. He was like extremely troubled by it, as you can imagine. Right. Um, and he now works as a speaker who trains 911 operators. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. On like the proper response, um, and that kind of thing and what signs to look for. Wow. So uh, Susan's dad, Chuck, has not given up hope. He still hopes to find Susan's body. He doesn't believe she's alive, but he believes that someday they might find her. Uh, he believes that more information may lie in Josh's encrypted hard drives, which still have not been cracked by police. And it sounds like pretty basic, but like listening to how they've done it, they spent, I mean, ten, like because he encrypted them with these insane, like computers can't crack them. Like they had computers running and running, trying every wow. combination and they can't. They can't cr- uh, crack the code. So they tried. Um, they haven't been able to do it yet. He's actually lobbied major tech companies in an effort to help investigators gain access to the drives. And that's something that I think they're still working on. At least they were when I did this um, wow. in September. So I, I also think the fact that he went to such lengths to encrypt all of these hard drives. Right. They're, I'm, I imagine. I mean, it's got to be something pretty awful if you really want it to be just so secret. So secret. And he actually saved everything. He saved every single receipt every single piece of paper like everything was scanned and saved and he had hundreds of hard drives like he saved every little scrap of their lives so 
hopefully at least in that way there's something that they can maybe trace right. um so if you i just want to add if you or anyone you know is experiencing domestic abuse of any kind even if you're not totally sure um in the u.s you can contact the national domestic violence hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or visit the hotline.org where they have an anonymous chat available 24 7 365 mm. and that is the <clears throat> terribly tragic tale of the disappearance of susan powell and then people applauded. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> they were like, um, I don't think we want to applaud. Well. And our manager was like, wow, what have I gotten myself into? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the, that was the first night that he ever came to one of our shows and was like, oh, I thought I signed up for a comedy Pretty show. Pretty sure that was the second time he ever met us. And we were like, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Well, that was like the second time we ever met him. I, I think, think it was. Wow. Anyway. Well, thanks for listening to that. Yeah. Sorry. I know that was kind of long, but. No. I'd been waiting to cover that for like years. And then when Salt Lake came up, I was like, I'll do it there. And then I wanted to wait longer to like retell it. So you forgot. I did. <laughs> Everything but the singing, which has apparently been burned. How could someone forget that? <laughs> That's been burned into your mind. Well, I think we all need an emotional grilled cheese. Oh, God, that sounds good. Uh, if any of that was pleasant for you, please come get tickets to our live show. Um, we are definitely not doing stories like this anymore. <laughs> Will I sing? Maybe. We, uh, our format is very different. Um, but if you would like to see us live, I don't know why, but please come. Please do it. We will be there. We would like you to be there. Um, and then there, I've been telling Christine every single time we sign off, I'll say, and she I goes know, back. I was hoping you would say, say why she says we, and I say drink. And you would think that'd be where we close off. But Christine's always got to have the final say. So I don't do it on purpose for the last, if you listen to like the last like 30 episodes, I'll be like, and that's why we drink. And then Christine goes, woo. <laughs> I just so, feel like it needs a punctuation, like an so, exclamation point. So we're going to do it in reverse this time. And I'll probably also... I, I'm just like, I feel like an asshole because I'm like, I need the final word, I guess. But it's just, I feel it's like it's not I'm a control. It's that like, how do like, <clears throat> Christine, like Christine also has to like lean over and turn off the recording. And there's that weird second in the middle. So I think it's your, your filler. I'm filling for that the space. gap because I'm too anxious to just like, let us sit in silence for that. Like four seconds. Yeah. Okay. I'll say okay, drink. Okay, and okay. as I say, drink, you, you turn it off. Sure. And that's why we drink. Wait. Wait. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, and you go. Yeah. Do it again. And that's why we drink. <laughs> it still took too long. I, I-